Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah to God. Be the glory, great things he has done. Amen. And I welcome us tonight to another Bible study. God bless you. In the name of Jesus, we welcome everyone that is tuning in, wherever you're tuning in from. And we pray, you know, that the will of God be done tonight. As we proceed, I'd like to just read a word of prayer. And then we get straight into the word of the Lord. Lord, we come before you one more time. Father God, we appreciate you. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercies. We thank you for your manifold blessings upon us. We thank you for life, almighty God. We are here in the land of the living. Oh God, as we are here tonight to get into your word, we pray, God, that you be in our midst. We pray, God, that you will touch our hearts, that you touch our minds, you touch our spirits, and that Jesus Christ, you will surround us, God. We pray, oh, tonight, that as the words come forth, that it will not be words of a man, but it will be words, mighty God, from your throne room, that which you want your people to hear. We pray, God, that you will use this word to save souls, use this word to keep souls, and let your will be done as we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercies. Amen. We bless your name. We bless your name. We give you glory. Hallelujah. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. Amen. Amen. So we have been dealing with doctrine, and we have looked at what doctrine, what the meaning of doctrine is, is really the teaching, and we look at how we can identify false teachings and we look now at the apostles doctrine and the Bible says in Acts that they continue steadfastly in the apostles doctrine and then <coughs> we look at the main aspects of what the apostles preach and teach and they, we said that these five things are faith, belief in God and repentance Recognizing that you're a sinner, turning from that sin, turn to God, dedicating yourself to God. The Bible says, he that confesseth and forsaketh his sin shall have mercy. Then we look at water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And we look at the mood and the formula. And we then went into the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8 verses, verse 9. Without the Spirit of God, you are none of His. And then we looked at holiness last week. And we just want to recap a little bit on holiness, and then we will get into the doctrine. As we go forward, we will be looking now at the different doctrines. And remember, we said earlier on in the lesson that the, 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 the Bible said that we should embrace the apostles' doctrine and that we should stand in the apostles doctrine but then there are some doctrines that the bible said that we must shun that we must not accept them that we must detest them amen and we want to just spend some time look at these doctrines look at what they are about and then be able now to tell us that the reason why the bible tell us that we should shun these doctrines Amen. Because if you know, really, if we accept it, this teaching, this false teaching, then it would push us or force us to turn our backs on God. And we really don't want to turn our backs on God. We want to serve the true and living God. Now you know the scriptures we have been reading. First Timothy four, from verse one to verse three. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times. Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrine of devils. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God had created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth and then we go down to second timothy 4 from verse 1 through to verse 4 amen 
I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own loss shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned to fables. Amen. So we said la last week, now we looked at holiness. And we start by looking at 1 Peter 1, 13 to 16. Wherefore, gird up the lines of your mind. And the Bible is telling us that holiness really has to do with our mind. Amen. And we talk about the apostle in Romans chapter 12. And when he said that, that we should not be conformed to the world, but we should be transformed by the renewing of our mind. No, I mention, and it's important that we understand that it's within our mind. It's with the mind that we worship God, and it's in the mind that we come to the conclusion that we are going to, whatever it takes, live the life pleasing to God. As I have been saying, none of us is perfect, and there are times when we will fall. But the Bible says, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. But as much as possible, amen, we should try to live for God. God has given us the Holy Spirit so that we can live above sin. So the apostle said, gird up the lines of your mind. Be sober and hope, and hope to the end of grace. That is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former loss in your ignorance, but as he which had called you is holy, so be he holy in all manner of conversation. And we said that word conversation there mean lifestyle. So be holy in all manner of lifestyle. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. And so, again, it starts in our mind. And while we might teach what the Bible tells us about holiness and, and, and tell the saints what God requires, amen, it's important that we understand that it is the individual who has to make up in his mind to live holy. Without you having that made up mind to live holy, you are going to find yourself doing anything and you are going to find yourself often time coming before the altar of God. Yes, we want to come before the altar of God to talk to him. And every time we come before him because of his holiness, we have to recognize and we have to ask God to, Lord, look here, forgive me of my sins. And the Bible says we sin when we think it not. But we don't want to come before God with anything repetitive. And we do it today, we do it tomorrow. And every time we come before God, we are asking God for forgiveness. God wants us to, 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 to move beyond that. He wants us to move past that and get to the point where we can stand and make the decision to say that we are going to live for him. So the, it is important that we know that it is the individual. Bishop can teach all he wants to teach and, and, and Minister Martin can, can preach and teach all he wants, but it is the individuals who have got to make up their minds that they are going to live for God. I want us to know, as I mentioned, that God has only one standard for holiness, and that is his standard. Um, the standard that he has is not your standard. Amen. Because your standard would tend towards sinning. But the standard that God has for holiness is his standard. Be ye holy, the Bible says, for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. We also established last week that God is holy. And we look at some scriptures like Exodus 15, 11, Who is like unto you among the gods, O Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in praise, and working wonders? 
1 Samuel 2 and 2, there is no one holy like the Lord. Indeed, there is no one besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. Isaiah 6, verse 2 and 3. These are the angels, we said, that were before the Lord. They were in his presence day and night. Amen. And the Bible says, Above the throne stood seraphims, and each had six wings. With twain they cover their face, and with twain they cover their feet, and with twain they did fly, and one cried unto another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, whose glory filled the earth. In Revelation, we look at the scripture, and the Bible says that the four and living creature did um, cry before the throne day and night, holy, holy. These are angels, and they are before the throne of God. And all they do is, this is just how the holiness of God is. How, how, amen. You can't put a measure to it. Your words cannot express how holy God is. So there is a call to be holy. God has called every individual to live a life that is holy. Amen. Just as we call folks in the Old Testament, so it is that today in the, the church era, God called people to be holy. Amen. Leviticus 11, 44 to 45. God instructed Moses and Aaron, and he said, Say to the children of Israel, he was instructing them on the things that they should eat to be different from the other nations around them. Remember, you know, they, they were on their journey. They wore the same clothes like the other nation. They wear standards like the other nation. They, they, they live in tents like folks from the other nation. So God had to do some things to separate them. Amen. And what he did was give them some things and he said, look here, this is all you're supposed to eat. These are the things that you're supposed to do. And if you do them, then I will consider you as my own and I will consider you as be, being holy. I want us to know that God was specific. For I am the Lord your God. He shall therefore sanctify yourselves and he shall be holy for I am holy. Neither shall ye defile yourselves, and ye shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall ye defile yourselves with any manner of creeping things that creepeth upon the earth. For I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. He shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. So he was specific. It was a call to the children of Israel to separate themselves from the nations around them. The thing that God told them to do, the thing that he told them to eat and not to eat, and the way how they worship made them different from the other nations around them. There is a call, and God called who he wants to call, and he called the children of Israel. So look here, separate yourself, live holy, because... I am your God and I am a holy God and I want you to be holy. The call, when we look in the New Testament, Romans 12 verse 1, I beseech you by the mercies, therefore brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable, it's not even a, 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 a good, a good enough, you know. He said reasonable service. Amen. And, and God wants us to give him our best. And if our best is just reasonable, that is what God wants. So Paul said, I beseech you, present your body as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Paul admonition to the believers in Rome was to sacrifice themselves to God. Not as a sacrifice that was put on the altar under the Mosaic law. Amen. But sacrifice yourself, deny yourself, and live to please the Lord. 
The born again believer must heal his entire being, must heal his entire self to the Lord as an instrument of righteousness. Therefore, let self be slain and we all become the children of God. It's no longer about us. I must decrease. Amen. And Jesus Christ increase. It's not about you, but it's about the God in you. And if we find ourselves denying ourselves and pleasing the Lord in our walk, we'll find that our Christian life will be, be a better Christian life. We'll find that we will walk in authority. We'll find that we will have more power in the Holy Ghost to operate and to do what the Holy Ghost wants us to do. First Thessalonians 4, verse 7. For God has not called us to impurity, but in holiness. So God has not called us to anything impure. Amen. And he's called us to holiness. He has called us to righteousness. Second Corinthians 6. Verse 17, therefore, come out from among them, O God, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Come out from among them, and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean things, and I will receive you. Amen. We said that holiness, the dictionary said that it's purity, it's integrity. But we, last week, worked with the definition which says that it's a call to separation. Amen. So holiness is a call to separation. So the Bible says, come out from among them and be a separate, say the Lord. Come out from among who? Amen. So, though we are in the world, we are not of the world. We, get, we are called by God to be an example when he called the children of Israel. He called them to be an example to the other nations around them, to show them that there is a God and this God is the only God to be worshipped. I want us to know that in this dispensation, in this time, it is the same call. God call us. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. And what he wants to do is for our lights to shine that others might see and glorify him who is in heaven. So there's a call for us to live holy when Peter repeats the Lord's word in 1 Peter 1 verse 16. It is written, be ye holy for I am holy. He is taking he is talking specifically to believers. As believers, we need to be set apart from the world unto the Lord. We need to be living by God's standards, God's status, God's principles, God's precepts, and make sure that the word of the Lord abides in us. God is calling us to separate in ourselves from the world. Love not the world, neither the things of the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God, the Bible says, abideth forever. I want to implore again, as I did last week, church make sure that we endeavor to do the will of God. It's only when we do the will of God, then we will abide forever. Praise God. Amen. So in order for anything to be holy now, we did say that in order for anything to be holy, must be connected to the source. And God is the source of holiness. Revelation 15 4 says, Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify, name, glorify your name? For you alone are holy. Nothing is holy except God's presence is in that place. Except God's presence is over that thing. We said that when Moses went to that spot of ground, he said, Moses, take off your shoes. Because where you're standing is holy ground. I want you to understand that probably Moses 
I had went to that place many times before. But now God came to meet him at that place. And he had to take off his shoes. Because once the presence of God came there, the place was, look here, it's, it, it's, that is how God is. Anywhere he goes, it, it, it just becomes holy. That is how holy God is. Amen. First Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen generation, so you are not any normal person now that God chose you. Now that you accept this way and you come to know him, you are no ordinary person. And you must stay connected to the source. If you are going to remain holy, if you are going to continue to live holy, you must be connected to the source. How we remain connected to the source? We said it and we preach it, we teach it all the time. You must have a consistent prayer life with the Lord. And you must set aside your day of fasting. Amen. And, and even when you feel tired, draw and still try to give God. Yes, you must get your rest. And sometimes it's better you get your rest. And, and when you get up, you know you can give God something. Amen. And sometimes you have to switch your prior time. Because sometimes the adversary is there waiting on you. And by the time you go down there, he just bombard you with sleep. But you just switch your time. When he comes that time, you are sleeping. Amen. And, and you, have to just, you, you have to remain connected to the source. We also said that which is holy is separated unto God for a possession. The Bible says that we are bought with a price. So if we are bought with a price, we are no longer ours. We belong to God. And guess what? If we belong to God, God then should be able to do what he wants to do with his possession. So anything God wants to tell us, anywhere God wants to direct us, he can say, look here, this is where I want you to go. This is who I want you to marry. Because God has control. Anything that is separated unto God, God own it. And God own you and God own me. Amen. And God should be able to do whatever he wants to us. I want us to get to that place. I want to get to that place where wherever God wants of me. Amen. That is what I am willing to do. Because I am not my own. I belong to God. To be holy, we must obey the word of God. If we are going to live holy, we must obey the word of the Lord. Leviticus 27, 20, verse 7 and 8 teaches us that there is an inseparable relationship between holiness and obedience to scriptures. God said, sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy, for I I am the Lord your God. Again in Leviticus 22, 31 to 32, you shall keep my commandments and do them. I am the Lord and you shall not profane my holy name. But I will sanctify I will be sanctified among the sons of Israel. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. In the same breath, God commands us to be holy. He commands us to obey his word. Therefore, holiness is displayed by us being obedient to the word of God. If you want to live holy, you must be obedient to the written word. To the directives. Why should I live holy? Because God says so. God could have probably said anything but himself. We must live holy. So it's not according to what we want. But according to what the Lord wants. Why should I live holy? Because it's a command. Be ye holy. For I the Lord your God is holy. Why should I be holy? Because it is a requirement. Why should I live holy? It is how we follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man 
shall see God. You shall see him, but probably as a frowning judge. So it's important that if we want to get to that place that we live holy, as people of God, living holy means that we must separate ourselves from the things of the world, the music of the world, amen, the, 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 these things that carry our minds to some place that our minds should not be. We need to separate ourselves and how we dress or we attire ourselves. What is on the inside will ultimately show on the outside. So as people of God living for God, it's important that we be separate and apart. We must live holy if we are going to get to that place. Amen. And so, like we said last week, we are going to now focus on the different doctrines. And we want to look at each, probably not in the entirety because it went, that would take some time, but, but just to point out some important points. Because as people of God, we are living in a time right now where the spirits of this doctrine are alive. I want you to understand that they that before long, the adversary will be, uh, the, 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 the Antichrist will be on the scene. I want you to know that the Antichrist will have a lot of false prophets around him. And I want you to know that the spirit of the, the, spirit of the false prophet is here. So you might be hearing some people saying some things. And you say, oh yes, this person is prophet so and so. I want us to understand that we must be careful of who we listen to, we must be careful of what we believe, else we are going to find ourselves drifting from the Lord. And so the Bible warns us that we should hold our ground, continue in the apostles' doctrine, amen, and stand on the sure foundation. But the Bible also warns us that we should shun every appearance of evil, false doctrine are evilous. Amen. They come from the adversary himself and the Bible warns us to stay away from them. Now as we continue like I say and we look at these different doctrines, we want to start with the doctrines of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. As we go through these doctrines from here on out, we will go through the practices and we will point out to us the reason why we should avoid them and the reason why we should live pleasing to the Lord. So I want to just make this point that as we talk about the apostles doctrine, we spoke about the apostles doctrine. We only mentioned five things and but there are other things that we could look at that the apostles preach on. But as we go through this doctrine now and you're going to see the kind of behavior and you're going to see how God requires us to behave. And we are going to put them together and say, look here, that can't work because this is what God wants. Amen. So Jesus spoke about the leave. Let us turn to Matthew 16, verse 6. So Jesus spoke of the leaving of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then Jesus said unto them, take heed. And beware of the leaving of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Then let's go to Mark 8 and verse 15. And he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaving of the Pharisees and the leaving of Herod. Let's look at Luke 12, verse 1. In the meantime, when they were gathered together in an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, beware, E of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. As in any of Jesus' teaching, he used everyday item to bring across his point. 
in this case, leaving our yeast to demonstrate a spiritual truth. In Luke 12, verse 1 that we read, Jesus refers to the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Jesus' point was that the teaching of the Pharisees were pervasive in that they, they exist, existing are to spread throughout every part of something and to produce hypocrisy. So Jesus was saying now oh, that the teaching of the Pharisees, the teaching of the Sadducees, that what, the, what it does, you, you receive it and then it just spread. And when it spread now, it becomes hypocrisy. And Jesus warned his disciples against the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Let us look at Matthew 16, 6 to 11. So as we look at this, this passage, when the disciples heard Jesus comment about the leaving of the Pharisees, they concluded and say among themselves, it is because we did not bring any bread. Then Jesus said unto them, take heed, and beware of the leaving of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And they reason among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. Which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves, because ye have brought no bread? Do ye not understand? Neither remember the five loaves of the five thousand and how many baskets he took up. Neither the seven loaves of the four thousand and how many baskets he took up. How is it that he do not understand that I speak it not to you concerning bread, that he should be aware of the leaving of the Pharisees? and of the Sadducees. Jesus had to remind them about the two miracles of feeding 5,000 and the 4,000 and emphasize that they did not need to worry about food. Jesus was not speaking about the physical leaving. He was, however, speaking about the spiritual Lee and the, physic, the spiritual man must be fed. But what you feed the spiritual man with is important. The doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, we might not have the Pharisees and the Sadducees teaching today, but the spirit of the doctrine is still alive today. Just as Jesus warned his disciples, I want to warn us tonight. To be aware of the doctrines of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The gospel refers to the Sadducees and, Sadduc and Pharisees as Jesus fulfilled his early ministry. He was in almost constant conflict with them. As his doctrine was different for the most part and opposing to their. They were always asking questions to put him in a spot, to tempt him, the Bible says. And he always provides a response that, dis that dismisses them. The fact that Jesus used the word leaving to warn his disciples, beware of the leaving of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Both statements use leaving as a both testament, Old and New Testament. Use leaving as a symbol of sin. Because of what it does to a lump. They say a little leaving, leaving the whole lump. Once yeast enters the door, it immediately begins to spread. By breaking down, it reacts to the dough's sugar. And producing a gas that puffs up the bread. Like leaving when sin enters a person's life. It begins to corrupt and fill him with vanity. A person will become en enslaved by habitual sin. 
and we have a difficult time growing and overcome. A difficult time abiding in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Because of sin corrupting influence. Sin defiles and can permanently destroy a relationship with God. I want you to know one of the reasons why we need to be aware. A little leaving leave at the whole lump. So once you begin to start listening and then you start accepting what the false teachers, the false preachers are saying, before long you're going to find yourself, amen, outside of God and Christ. Before long you're going to find yourself doing things that you would not dream that you would do. I want you to be aware and to understand that the, the adversary is so subtle, his thing is so subtle, and if you're not careful, you will find yourself on the outside by warning the disciples against the hypocrisy or the leaving of the Pharisees Jesus sought to keep his followers from proceeding in a gradual subtle way so let us look at some of the practices during the time of Jesus's ministry the Sadducees and the Pharisees they comprise of the ruling class when we look at both groups closely, we recognize that there are some similarities both, between both. But there are also some important differences between them as well. Both groups honored Moses and the law. So when it comes to Moses and the law, they, they honor him. They say, yes, Moses is the man. God gave him the law. He led the people, the children of Israel out of, out of Egypt and led them to, to, to the border of the promised land. Amen. So they honor Moses and they honor the law. They respect it. Both also had a measure of political power. The Sanhedrin, which was the 70-member Supreme Court in ancient Israel, had members from both the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The difference between both though are known to us from a couple of passages. Religiously, the Sadducees were more conservative in one area or another. They insisted on a literal interpretation of the scriptures. So the Sadducees said, look here, if the Bible said, go down the road, that is what the Bible means, a literal interpretation they're not looking at any spiritual interpretation they're looking at a literal thing amen and it's the same thing that we have been talking about for a couple of weeks now for some folks like we said if it's not written in the bible amen if it's not written in the bible word for word then they will dismiss it as man-made show me where it's written in the bible and i will do what it says, but if it's not written in the Bible, and this is what the Sadducees say, I want you to understand that the spirit of the Sadducees is still alive, and folks that are in church are saying that if it's not written verbatim, then they are not going to do it. They will go as far to say that this is the tradition of men. I want to warn us to be aware of the doctrine of the Sadducees, if it's not written in the Bible, I am not going to do it. But the principles are there, and if the principles are there, it is good to obey, and we said it. Amen. And so this is one of the things that the Sadducees said. If it's not written, I am not going to do it. So look at this scripture, 1 Timothy Two, verse 9 and 10. Verses 9 and 10. If it's not dear, I am not going to do it. In like manner also, that woman adorned themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided ear or gold or pearls or costly arrays, but which becometh woman professing godliness with good works. 
Now let me read from the English Standard, English Standard Version. Likewise also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for a woman who profess godliness with godly works. So the Bible did not say, amen, the Bible did not say, don't show your legs. It did not say, don't show your cleavage. But the Bible said that women must dress modestly. But people in church would argue, amen, and I don't know why the Holy Spirit said use the scripture, but people in church will argue and say, look here, it's not there. Modesty is leave up to my interpretation. So if the thing is above me and, and when I sit down, I, I having problem, I have to do all kind of thing. You're, you're not comfortable, then why are you still weird? But look here, I want you to know that it, it is not up to you. The Bible says, dress modesty, dress modestly. In a manner that is not elaborate or indecent. So now your bishop tell you, do not wear things that is too short. And do not wear the things that suck on and hug you up. And that you can see everything. Amen. You can see everything. And the bishop tell you that. And you're now saying that because the bishop says so, it's not in the Bible. So I'm not doing it. So the bishop say, men, don't wear the pants are tight till it squeeze your front buff up. Don't wear it. And you're saying that, look here, that is not in the Bible, so we can't wear a tight pants. So though it is not there word for word, the principle is there. To govern what the leader under God tells us to do. Very important. I want you to understand that when the Lord wrote to the church in Revelation, He said, write unto the angel of the church. The angel is the pastor or the bishop in our case. Is the same man that has to answer for your soul. And the principles you will understand if him says something and you know that it's far from scripture. That is the time you're supposed to run. But if the man is trying to get us to live right and to live holy, don't say that it is not in the Bible verbatim so you're not doing it. The, the Bible says that we should adorn ourselves modestly. So God put the principle there. Move up on the heart of his leader and said, this is how I want you to do it. This is what I want you to tell the people. And we are saying that, look here, if it's not in the Bible, we're not, it, it's just not going to work. I will say this, that if we find it hard to Obey the leader that God placed above us. It's probably better we find somewhere else that we can work with. And that is why the Bible says that they are going to find, they are going to find persons that will minister to what they want to hear. They are going to find persons that will allow them to do what they want to do. The Bible said it, the first scripture that we read in Timothy, that's what it says. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. So the Sadducees, 
They said, if it's not written in the Bible, amen, they, they're not going to obey it. And I want to warn us, be aware of the leaving of the Sadducees. I want to warn the church, be aware of the spirit of the Sadducees. Not because it is not there. Remember, we also said some weeks ago that the Lord said that I am going to write the laws on the tables of your heart. And so even if the bishop don't say it, there is a spirit that one on one connection and God put the Holy Ghost in you and the Holy Ghost will now convict you and say, look here, that thing is wrong. Hallelujah. And you have got to be aware of the leaving of the Sadducees. So given that the Pharisees and the Sadducees have different views, it is no surprise that they argued over certain teachings. The Sadducees rejected. They rejected. The resurrection of the dead. They said that, look here, no person can raise from the dead. Let us look at Matthew 22, verses 23 to 34. The Sadducees rejected a belief in the resurrection of the dead. The same day came to him, the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection, and asked him, saying, Master, Moses said, if a man die, having no children, his brother shall marry to his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. And behold, there was a great Now there was with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, having no children, left unto his brothers. Likewise, the second also, and the third, unto the seventh. And the last of all the women died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Jesus answered and said unto them, He do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they, they neither married nor given in marriage. But are as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, he have not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of the living. And when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. But when the Pharisees heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they gathered together. In other words, the, Sadduc the Pharisees were happy that Jesus put them together. The passage tells us that the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. This was the reason why they asked that kind of a question, trying to check Jesus. But Jesus said, you don't understand the resurrection because when the resurrection happened, they, they, are, they, they are like the angels. So there is no married, not given in to marriage. They are like the angels. So Jesus dismissed them. The fact that they did not believe in the resurrection meant that they would discredit the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I will see it in scriptures. After they successfully sent Jesus to the cross, the members of the San, Sanhedrin, Fear that his disciple would sneak in and steal his body. So they asked and received soldiers to guard the tomb. Although they did not believe that such thing, look here, they did not believe that such thing could happen. They took 
Jesus claimed that he would rise again three days in a literal sense. You see the irony of it? They did not believe, but yet they put soldiers there. Because they say, we don't want anybody to come and steal the body. But in the back of their minds, they were saying, we have God there, so if him raised, we're going to know. Now in Matthew 28, 1 to 6, Mary Magdalene, the Bible says, and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. And the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. So it's not any man roll away the stone. It was the, and it was a big stone. So a good amount of men would have to come and roll away the stone. He appeared and was like lightning, and his clothing was white as snow. And fear fell upon the guards. I want us to listen to this you now. The guards trembled and became like as dead men. But the angel said unto the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. And as he said, Come and see where he laid. Let us now look at Matthew 28, 11 to 15. So the angel said to them, Go and tell them that the Lord has risen. While they were going now, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. So look here, they tell the chief priest, you know, that Jesus rose, you know. Nobody took his body. An angel came and rolled away the stone because the God saw it, you know. An angel came and rolled away the stone and tell both Marys that the Lord is risen. The gods heard it. And the Bible says, they came and told the chief priest, all that had taken place. And when they had assembly with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, tell the people. His disciple came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money. And they were directed, and as this story has been spread among the Jews unto this day. The Bible says so. Story spread, is reported, commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Until this day, some of the Jews said that the Messiah, the Messiah has not yet arrived. I want you to understand that this spirit that goes with the doctrine of the Sadducees is a wicked and a dreadful spirit. I want you to also note that there are modern days Pharisees and Sadducees that teaches that hell is a place, is not a place of eternal suffering, but is rather a common grave. So what they're teaching, you know, is that when the person dies, that is hell. They're going to the grave. The grave that they put in is hell. Modern day Pharisees and Sadducees. They are modern day Pharisees and Sadducees who teaches that the soul is simply the life force within a person. So when a person dies, the life force of leave the body. And that is it. Oh, glory to God. There are modern day Pharisees and Sadducees who teaches. That Jesus' resurrection from the dead was not physical, but a spiritual one when all the evidence says that Jesus wrote physically. Thomas reached thither thy finger 
and behold my hands. Reach thy hand into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. There are modern day Sadducees and Pharisees who will tell you that there is no such thing as the resurrection. Modern day Sadducees will tell you that there is no such thing as the resurrection. But the Apostle Paul says that if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is vain and your faith is also vain. So what we preach and what we teach and what we believe is hinged upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If the devil can get you to even wonder if Jesus really get up from the grave. If he can cause you to doubt that, then you will doubt your salvation, you will doubt your eternal redemption, and you will even doubt that you are saved. Beware of the leaving of the Sadducees. Oh, glory to God. Beware of the leaving of the Sadducees. 1 Corinthians 15, 12 to 18. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection? Look here. I want you to understand that it is not just now that folks have, not, have been saying that Jesus didn't raise. I, it is not just now that folks are saying that, we, that there will be no resurrection. They have been saying it from a long time. And when the apostle write to the Corinthians, he say, No, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Before, if you read further up in Corinthians, you will see where he lists out a set of people who were eyewitness at the resurrection of Jesus. And he did that to convince the folks at Corinth that look here, you need to do away with the doctrine of the Sadducees. The doctrine of the Sadducees will cause you to doubt your eternal redemption. Christ is coming to redeem us from this body of death. And if you doubt, amen, the resurrection, you're going to find yourself left behind. And that is all conniving and wicked the spirit is that is preaching to people today and telling them that the meek shall the meek shall in any inherit the earth but a new heaven and a new earth amen and i want you to understand the scriptures tonight i don't know about you but i have no shadow of a doubt that as christian as a child of god christ is risen from the dead I have no doubt. So the apostle said, if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. Then is your preaching vain and your faith also vain. It means, uh, look here, it's vain, it's nothing, might as well, you know, you know but with this Christian walk, if Christ did not raise from the dead. Because everything that we believe is hinged upon that. Yeah. And we are found false witnesses of God. So if Christ did not raise, you know, we are found false. So when we come and we preach Christ, we are false witnesses. Because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ. Whom he raised not up. If so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised? And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your... So if Christ did, is not risen, you're still in sin. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. You're still in sin. And I want you to under, uh, look here. When we, when we read the scripture, I you know Jesus said, Beware of the leaving. We need to understand these doc, the, what these men practice, what these men taught, what they believe. 
and they believe in no is is a wicked thing not to believe that there is a resurrection and if Christ be not raised your faith amen is V and E R stealing your sins you're not saved Then they also which are falling asleep in Christ are perish. It means that those who are now dead in Christ don't have any hope of being raised. Amen. But he said, if in this life only we have hope, then we are of all men most miserable. What we have tonight, church, is inch upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I know without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is risen from the dead. I don't know about you. I know without a shadow of a doubt, Christ has risen from the dead. Nevertheless, look at this scripture. St. John 16, verse 7. Hallelujah. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. Oh, Jesus. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go out. Is Jesus saying this now? You know? Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. In other words... Because Jesus went away, the Holy Ghost came. And because I am a recipient of the Holy Ghost, I know without a shadow of the doubt, amen, that the resurrection if, is real. I come against the spirit that is troubling the minds of the people of God. There are some folks who are doubting, amen, whether they are saved or not. But once you have the Holy Ghost, you should not have any shadow of doubt. Amen. Whether you are saved or not, you should not have any shadow of a doubt that Christ is going to come and redeem you from this body of death. I have gone to prepare a place for you that where I am, there we will be also. Amen. I come against the spirit. Amen. That is telling people in the name of Jesus Christ that there will be no resurrection. It's a lie from the pit of hell. There is going to be a resurrection. Let us look at 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 14. Let's go from 14 to 17. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so then also with sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. That we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet him in the air. Let me just pause here. Remember last week, when we, we, two weeks ago, when we talked about the, the, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, we said that if you don't have the Holy Ghost, you will not have that change in agent that will cause you to know change and to meet the Lord in the ear. No, I said that I'm sure a while ago that, I, that the resurrection is real. Why? Because I have the Holy Spirit. A lot of time, people doubt. Amen. And if the devil can cause you to doubt, amen, that you, you, you have the Holy Spirit. You have you hook. Hallelujah. But I want somebody to know tonight that you must be confident in God and, and confident in the work that God has done. You can't reach a point where you're doubting that the Holy Ghost lives in your life. The Holy Ghost dwells in you. 
No man, you must be sure you must have that relationship with God. Amen. And you must go down and pray and the Holy Ghost make intercession and you know that someone is living in you. But you can't make the adversary cause, cause any doubt. He did it with Eve. Did the Lord say that you shall surely die? And he just hook her with that. And the adversary will try to hook us. Cause you to doubt your salvation. Look here. It's the, I don't know a person said they're serving God. And them say they go to an altar. Them have the Holy Ghost. Oh, you know, boy, I go to the altar and pray. And the man say I have the Holy Ghost. There must be something tangible even though you can't see it. I want you to understand. I can't see it. But I can feel him moving on the inside. This Holy Ghost is real. The resurrection is real. For if we believe that Jesus is died. And rose again. Even so them which also sleep in Jesus. Will God bring with him. For this we say then. Unto you by the word of God. That we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Mighty God. Look here. It's Bible we're reading and we have Holy Ghost. Let spirit connect to spirit. And you understand what the adversary is trying to do. It is trying to destroy the people of God. By causing you not to believe in the resurrection. Amen. I come against that one more time. In the name of Jesus. Christ. So those who die in Christ will rise again. And those who die outside of Christ will rise to be judged of God. I want to encourage anyone and implore anyone who is watching right now. You're not saved. I want you to listen to the word of God. There is going to be a resurrection. If you live a life that is acceptable in the sight of God and you die on earth, God is going to raise you up. If you live a life of sin, God is going to raise you up and judge you. Don't follow the spirit of the Sadducees that says there is going to be no resurrection. And that when you die, amen, the, 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 the life has gone and that is it. No, there is, God is going to raise up the sinners and he's going to judge them. And he's going to give them the reward that they deserve. The life that you live now determines where you're going to spend eternity. And I encourage you, I implore you, make sure that you're right with God. John 5, 28 and 29. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. And shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life. And they that have done evil unto the resurrection. Look here. I am warning somebody tonight. Amen. I am warning. So Look here. I am warning somebody that has received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But guess what? You're, you're, you're living. You're towing the line. I want you to understand that if you die in sin, you are going to raise and be judged and be condemned. But if you live pleasing to God, if you live pleasing and acceptable in the sight of God, amen, you are going to be resurrected unto life.
bless the name of Jesus. Listen to this. A quarter, so there were some polls that were done in the U.S. and polls that were done in Great Britain. Um, because, you know, when, when it comes Easter time, they talk about the resurrection. So they want to get an idea of folks who believe in the resurrection. And this was done in 2010 by BBC Radio. 17% of all people that were called believe the Bible word for word. 31% of Christians believe, word for word, the Bible. Raising the total to 57% among active Christians. Those who go to service one time per month, two times per month. Exactly, now listen to this, exactly half of all the people surveyed did not believe in the resurrection. 46%. Of people say they believe in some form of life after death. And 46% did not believe in life after death. They did not believe in any form of resurrection. This number is too much. Why? Because the spirit of the Sadducees have blinded their minds, have blinded their hearts, and has caused them not to believe that there is going to be a resurrection. Church, I want you to understand that these are souls. And if there is no belief that there is going to be a resurrection and that people will be judged, then there will be no effort for a person to get their life right. In America, it is not so bad because 66% of those who were interviewed believe in the resurrection. So there is another 34% that don't believe in the resurrection. And this number is too much. These numbers are too much. Not to believe in the resurrection. People will not take the necessary steps to get their life right. Beware of the leaving of the Sadducees. The Sadducees says... There will be no resurrection. And I want you to know today that there will be a resurrection. Amen. So from Matthew 22, verse 23 that we have read, we can also, that we read, we could also deduce that the Pharisees believe in the resurrection. Because the same scripture, when Jesus dismissed the Sadducees, the Bible says that the Pharisees came together. So they believe in the resurrection. So they're not so bad. Amen. So the Pharisees believe in the re resurrection and the Sadducees denied the afterlife. Who will in that a soul perish at death? But the Pharisees believe in an afterlife and in an appropriate reward for punishment for individuals. The Sadducees reject the idea of an unseen spiritual world. Amen. Uh, they, 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 they reject this. And there are persons even nowadays that will tell you, and when we preach and say, look here, we, we, we we're fighting a spiritual battle, they will tell you that, look here, no spiritual battle. But the apostle tell you, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, and against, look here, the apostle tells us, but there are folks, the Sadducees rejected an unseen spiritual world. But look here, even man is made of body, spirit, and soul. And God is a spirit. So, so, if you, so look here, if you deny the fact of a spiritual world, you, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. If you dismiss the spiritual world, you will eventually dismiss that there is a God. The leaving of the Sadducees. But the Pharisees thought the existence of angels, demons, and the spiritual realm. So the, the Pharisees, not really so bad. But, but the Sadducees, man. 
Amen. So Jesus did many miracles, yet the Pharisees and Sadducees and the Herodian, as he mentioned in Mark 8, 15, still did not believe in him. Shortly before Jesus warned his disciples of the leave of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Pharisees and the Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him, show us a sign. Listen to what Matthew chapter 16 verses 1 to 5 says. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees. So what the Bible is saying now is that the Pharisees will now take the lead on this one. The Sadducees had their time when they asked their question. Like, like the earlier passage when we read when they asked about the man that died and his brother took the same woman. Whose woman will she be? Our wife will she be when they get there? So the Sadducees took the lead on that one. Amen. And they asked the question based on what they believe. Now the Pharisees now is taking the lead on this one. So the Bible says the Pharisees also with the Sadducees. So the Sadducees come along. To hear what the Pharisee is going to ask. And tempting desire him that he would show them a sign from heaven. And he answered and said unto them. When it is evening. He say. It will be fair weather. For the sky is red. And in the morning it will be foul weather. To the day, for the sky is red and lowering. How oh, hypocrites! He can discern the face of the sky, but he can, but can he not discern the signs of the time? A wicked and an adulterous generation seek after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it. But the sign of the prophet Jonas, and he left them and departed. So Jesus refused to give them a sign. If Jesus had given them a sign, probably they would have believed that this is really the Messiah. They said, say, give us a sign from heaven. And if he had given them the sign, they would say, well, this man must be the Messiah. But Jesus said, only sign shall be given unto you. It's a sign of Jonah. I want us to know that this exchange gives significant context to Jesus' mention, mentioning of the leaven. It was after this that he said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. The leaven of the Pharisees was subtle yet pervasive influence. The Pharisees exerted over the people. Those who followed the Pharisees might demand signs, but they would gradually increase in unbelief. They had hardened their hearts, just like the Pharisees. So do the Pharisees believe some of the things as it pertains to the resurrection and as it pertains to to the principles, you don't have to be there verbatim. The Pharisees believe that. But the Pharisees want to see a sign. And Jesus said a wicked and adulterous generation seek it after a sign. In the time that we are living in, people are seeking a sign. If you have a church and you're not telling people that when they come there, man getting up out of a wheelchair, when they come there, they're going to be blessed, so to speak. If you're not telling them certain things, they don't want to come. They want a sign. And guess what? They are given signs. The false teachers and false prophets and false teachers, they have power from the enemy to give sign. I want you to understand that the spirit of the Antichrist proceed him. The Antichrist is an Antichrist, is a false Christ. 
The Bible said that he will have no need for a woman. Amen. So the spirit of the Antichrist is here. Hence, there is an increase in false teachers and preachers and men who have received power from demons to give signs. And people are running down and you're going to get sign. If you're running down a sign, you're going to get it. A wicked and an adulterous generation seek a sign. Let us look at 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 8 and 9. And then shall that wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan. With what? All power and signs and lying wonders. When the, when the Antichrist gets here, he's going to be the chief among them that is here already. The spirit is here. But when he comes, he's going to be the chief among them. The closer we get to his coming and revealing himself, is the more you're going to see some last pass and you're going to see some things happen that support homosexuality. Today I hear that they have a new gender. Don't read it yet. I need to do some. You, have an, you can imagine God made meal and the spirit of the Antichrist is here. So it is with the false prophets. He's, he has given them power by the operation of demons to work wonders, to work signs. And people are drawn away. Amen. By these signs. Beware of the leaving of the Pharisees. The Pharisees want to see a sign. I want to tell the church, don't run down the sign. Amen. If I invite you to church and you're sick, I can't tell you that when you come, God won't heal you. But I can tell you that all you need to do to lift your feet. The Bible says, call for the elders. And when they pray the prayer of faith, if it is God's will, then God will heal. But we can't promise a healing. There are some folks that put on a convocation and say, when you come, it's a miracle convocation. How oh, him can guarantee your miracle? And it's the Lord's doing. We can pray. And we can fast and pray. But the doing is God's. And they promise you miracles. They promise you sign. And people, these are the things that people want. And it's a spirit that is driving people to think this way. But it's the spirit of the Pharisees. The Pharisees wanted sign. And there's a wicked generation that seek a sign. Beware, church. Don't seek a sign. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 24 to 30. For the Jews require, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the Jews require a sign and the Greek seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, 
the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the Jews require a sign. And this is one of the reasons why they doubt Jesus and them because Jesus didn't give them a sign. And the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach, we not promise anybody, promising anybody any sign. We will continue to preach Jesus and preach him crucified. I'm not going to tell you to come to my church. Amen. Because we're full of power and we're full of sign and we're full of wonder. No. We come and we preach the truth. We preach the death, burial, resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. You need to lift your feet in order to be saved. So the Pharisees seek a sign. Jesus didn't give them any. And today there are folks that are still seeking signs. And they will not be given a sign. You will see line wonders and you will believe it that look here, this must be the man of God because him doing so much things. Not recognizing that there's a spirit at work behind him. Again, let's go to Matthew chapter 23, 23. Look at starting from, yes, verse 1. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatever they bid you to observe, that observe and do. So Christ, Christ talk about what the Pharisees preach, you know. He said, Observe and do what they tell you to observe. But do not eat after their works, for they say and do not. They will tell you to do. We're just pausing here. They will tell you to do, but they will not do it. They will tell you that holiness is a requirement unto God, but they will not live holy. There are many scandals right now in the ev evangelical circles. Even here in our local church, local, our country, our, our, our church, the churches that are in our country. You recognize that there are so many scandals and preachers come and they preach and they say live holy. But they themselves not living holy. It's a spirit of the Pharisees. They will tell you to do what is written in the book. But they themselves will not do it. If you are a leader, you must lead by example. Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. So how is it that you're going to lead and you're not setting the example? The same thing that the leader does is the same thing that will trickle down in the congregation. Because the spirit that is up on the leader will influence his congregation. And if the leader is not doing the right thing, then the congregation will end up not doing the right thing. Because if bishop I do it, then it's all right for me to do it. Nobody can talk to me because the bishop I do it. Nobody can talk to me because the bishop wife I do it. Hallelujah, the spirit of the, Pharisee, uh, the Pharisees, they will tell you to do, tell you from scripture, but they're not doing it and we must be aware. So the life of the leader must be transparent. Amen, he must be able to relate to the church and the church must relate to him. So do what the Pharisees said to do. Do what the scribes said to do. But don't do what they do. And church, you know. 
you will know when your leader is living for God. And if your leader is living for God, follow him as he follows Christ. Beware of the leaving of the Pharisees. Verse 4, for they buy heavy burdens now. So they tell you to, to do it, but they're not doing it. And they buy heavy burdens and grievous. And grievous to be born. And lay them on men's shoulder. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. So not even the little finger. They will tell you to do some things, you know. Live holy. Deny the flesh. Try and do this. And not even with their little finger, they will try to do the same thing that they're preaching and tell you to do. The spirit of the Pharisee. But all their works, they do for what? To be seen of men. They make broad their philatric, philatories and enlarge the borders of their garments. And love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seat in the synagogue. And greetings in the markets. And to be called of men, Rabbi. Rabbi. Look here. I, I went to, I visit churches when we were able to visit churches. And promised somebody that I would visit. And when I call the person and I say to them, you know, I was there. They say, oh, I didn't see you. Because they want ministers to come and sit up in the chief. Look here. I don't have to go up there for anybody to say, Minister Bill, I am all right at the back of the church. The, the, the Pharisees have a spirit that they want to do everything to be seen. They want to do everything to be seen. Verse 5. But all their works they do to be seen of men. We are living in a time of social media. And folks want to be seen. You have some folks on Instagram. If they go into the bathroom, they Instagram or whatever they're doing. And say, look here, I'm going to the bathroom. If they're going to be here, they say, look here, I am going to have a shower. And take show you in the bathroom. Everything, they just want to be seen. It's the time of the social media. And people want to be seen. Let us look at 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5. But people want to be seen. And everything they do, they're announcing it. And it is coming from the Pharisees. It is a spirit of the Pharisees. They're doing the thing, you know. Preaching the word of God, but they want to see the amount of people who give them likes, and they want to see how many people viewing, and they want to see, look, and they just, it's just a time where people just want to be self to be seen. This know also that in the last days, perilous time shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Without natural affection, truth bearers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power of thereof, from such turn away. It was the same thing that met Ananias and Sapphira. And we mention it. They sold the parcel of land. They want to be seen, you know. Spirit of the Pharisees. 
Everything they do, they want to be seen. They're standing up, in, they want to pray. They're standing up in church. Everybody has to hear what they pray and say. And Jesus said, look here, if you come in your closet and whisper, Amen, your God is faithful to hear and answer. But the Pharisees want to be seen. Want to be, sir, yes, sir. So Ananias, and they sold their land. And if they sold it for 15,000, they could have said, Apostle, say 10 years. Apostle, say 5 years. But because they want to be seen and they want to look like, oh, I'm brother and sister, Ananias and, and Sapphira, they sold the land and they give everything. Let us give them a clap because they give everything to the church. So they come and they lie to the apostle because they want to be seen. And when they come and tell the lie, they drop down. Dead. I want to tell the church and tell individuals that if you want to be seen, you're not going to go nowhere. You're not going to get anywhere. If you want to be seen, you will be seen. But not by God. And Ananias and Sapphira want Wanted to be seen. Almighty God. And they come before the apostle and they lie. And they fell down dead. I want to tell the people of God. Just to humble yourselves. Just to remain humble. If you humble yourself. God will exalt you. Nobody try for anybody to see you. And you're known by people. Oh, no. No. Be, just humble yourself and God will do the rest. Beware of the leaving of the Pharisees. Look here, if you, if you follow these doctrines, the teachings and the doings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, if you follow it, you will find yourself in hell. And Jesus warned his disciples. Amen. To be aware of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Amen. 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 So a whole lot of folks, they, 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 they're giving to some organization. They want to announce it that they're giving to organization. They just want to be seen. And we are living in that time where people want to to be seen. But I want to encourage the church tonight that let us just remain humble. Let us just remain under the microscope of God. We don't have to broadcast anything. We don't have to, anybody don't have to see us. But remember, God himself sees us. Amen. So beware of the leaving of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. God bless you tonight in the name of Jesus Christ. So next week when we come back, we will continue, amen, and we will continue to look at the doctrine. We will look now at the doctrine of demons because when we read in 1 Timothy chapter 4, it, it mentions about the doctrine of demons, and we are going to look into it and to see what the Bible, and the Bible made some mention of some things there, you know. Him say, they will tell us that you must eat this, and it is, and God said, anything you make is not unclean, it's good. And we're going to go in the scriptures, we're going to look at it, and we're going to talk about this doctrine and talk why we should, as we have been doing with the doctrine trends of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. God bless you tonight in the name of Jesus. God's willing, next week, same time, same place, we will continue with doctrines. Amen. Just bow your heads. Lord, we again come to you and we appreciate you tonight. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for everything that was said. We pray, mighty God, that we will accept these words, O oh God, and that we will keep them in mind. We pray, O oh God, that they will accomplish what you want them to accomplish. Lord, it's all about the saving of souls. It's all about the keeping of souls. It's all about the guarding, great God, of the hearts of your people. In such a time like this, God, where the spirits are there, God, to snatch, to destroy the souls of men. But we pray, God, for your people tonight that we will remain strong, remain unmovable, 
Almighty God, always abounding in truth. We thank you for your love and your mercies. Let your will be done. Guide us as we go through the rest of this week as we give you thanks, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you again. Thank you for tuning in. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in. Just lift your hands. Just lift your hands and wave them unto the Lord. Amen. Just wave them unto the Lord and give him thanks. Thank you, Jesus. We bless your name. Hallelujah. We bless your name, Jesus. We worship and adore you tonight. Hallelujah. You are alone and worthy, Jesus. Amen. 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 God bless you. God bless you.